a wealthy businessman that did a lot of international traveling. And she was going to take care of this businessman's ailing father while they traveled. But within just a month of her arrival, Suzette appears to have vanished without a trace. Taking matters into her own hands, Carolyn Troughton calls her daughter's employer, demanding to know Suzette's whereabouts. He tells her that Suzette has decided to take off with a man named Jim Turner, and they were going to be sailing around the world, and she was not going to be working for him after all. Suzette Troughton was a mama's girl, was always in contact with her mom, either through email or on the telephone. Carolyn knew that her daughter would call her and let her fill her in on what was going on. She knew something terrible had happened to her. Police are worried, too. They've heard this story before, several times. And when Carolyn Troughton reveals the employer's name, it is one they know all too well, John Robinson. Ironically, the, the sergeant and the watch commander that reviewed the, the missing persons report that night both had dealings or were aware of John Robinson from the 1980s. This time, local police are determined not to let him slip through their fingers. And it isn't long before agents from the FBI's Kansas City field office join the investigation. We spent uh, a lot of our time scratching our heads and, and just trying to figure out what it is that that he was up to at the time he supposedly was running a business that was basically a magazine for mobile home trailer parks robinson's also married with four children and has worked hard to gain respect within the local community but police files tell a different story we knew he was a con man we knew he was a thief John had a number of convictions over the years, mainly for small-time uh, con artist types of activities, embezzlements, those sort of things. He never worked a legitimate job that he did not cheat the company out of some kind of money. Still, investigators find themselves facing a number of troubling questions. First and foremost, what would a two-bit con man be doing mixed up in the cases of four missing women? And how do you go about mounting an investigation with no evidence of an actual crime being committed? That we really needed to find all these individuals, make sure, number one, that they were alive, uh, and uh, uh, find out what kind of contact he was having with them. Uh, what was he trying to do? Authorities are particularly concerned about Tiffany Stacy, who disappeared at just four months old. We were all getting together on this, trying to get a handle on it, and we didn't know what was going to be at the end of this road. We had no idea. Soon, investigators get a new lead when letters and emails begin arriving at the home of Carolyn Troughton, all signed by her missing daughter, Suzette. Then they started receiving letters from uh, California. And then there were a letter from Veracruz, Mexico, that uh, kind of threw us for a loop. The mother never believed them. She said, you know, I read these letters, and I can tell by the way they're written, by the fact that there's no spelling errors, by the wording that she uses, the phrases that she used. She said, I can tell that my daughter is not writing these letters. But the perplexing thing to her and all of us was, she said, the signature is my daughter's. The pattern is a familiar one, but police hold off on confronting Robinson. They don't want to tip their hand just yet. Instead, they begin interviewing Suzette's family and friends, looking for anything that might bolster their case. What they discover next turns the entire investigation on its head. Well, Suzette Trout was kind of a free spirit. She was in the BDSM lifestyle. Uh, she was always on the internet with people in that 
lifestyle, and uh, she was ready to be on her own. BDSM stands for bondage and discipline, dominance and submission, sadism and masochism. A great deal of what this comes down to is somebody is enjoying the fantasy of having power and somebody is enjoying the fantasy of being powerless. Though legal, BDSM is a practice often conducted in secret. None of us really knew anything about it. So while we're trying to work the case, we're trying to learn about this lifestyle. Pain is part of this lifestyle. Uh, so slapping or, or spanking someone, that's natural. According to her friends, Suzette was a sexual submissive, or slave, who often surfed the internet looking for a master. A master is usually a person who owns a slave. The slave has acknowledged that person as their master. Uh, and they are held with a certain level of respect in the community. Investigators learned that Suzette had recently found a new master. But this time, she was in way over her head. Anybody who really is a master, it's very, very rare for them to refer to themselves as a master. According to Suzette's friends, she was a member of the bondage and discipline, dominance and submission, sadism and masochism community, or BDSM. More people have joined the community since the 90s, since the stigma has started to fall away. Police also learned that prior to her disappearance, Suzette corresponded with a BDSM master online and relocated to Kansas City to work as a nurse's aide for his elderly father. She would come to this area at the behest of this guy named John Robinson. But while Robinson has a checkered background, to say the least, on the surface, there's nothing to suggest the suburban father of four would have been involved in something like BDSM, let alone anything dangerous. For a missing person, name of the social worker. I never ever had the feeling that uh, this John Robinson was a killer. Our impression of John Robinson was that he was a small-time con artist who had been involved in a number of, of con schemes over the years, uh, but nothing really more than that. Still, with connections to a string of mysterious disappearances, there's no denying Robinson is more than he appears to be. Mr. Robinson had his hand in a lot of different uh, areas. Uh, he was uh, in, in various businesses. Uh, he made contact with uh, hospitals about unwed mothers. He'd also made contact with charities uh, about un unwed mothers, uh, helping them out. So it's very bizarre. He was after these women for some strange sexual reason. I'm not sure what it was. We knew that um, he was involved with at least three women that had been reported as missing to us in the 1980s. So we had a pretty good history on him. We had a pretty good feeling that the guy was up to no good. Paula Godfrey, Lisa and Tiffany Stacy. Catherine Clampett, and now Suzette Troughton. The question is, could any of these missing women still be alive? Could they be serving as sex slaves or something police haven't even considered? This was the type of case that, you know, you went home at night, and that's all you thought about is, what am I missing? What could I have done? What should I be doing? You're thinking of that as you drive to work, or as you're going through the file. You're going, there's got to be something here I'm missing. Determined to prove once and for all that this small-time crook is up to something more sinister, local police and FBI begin to dig deeper. We called in all the retired detectives that had, you know, worked his cases, the FBI agents, the Missouri probation officer, we were looking into his criminal background, uh, trying to find any clues that we could use against him. I believe the, the baby was probably still alive someplace. Tiffany Stacy, missing since 1985, would be 15 years old by now. 
We actually thought that he may have been involved in some sort of a baby selling uh, ring. And there was also uh, activity of uh, uh, prostitution involved in his background as well. well. We had a couple of informants. One was a guy uh, who was uh, in the topless bars. He was bird dogging uh, women for John Robinson. I had another informant who actually uh, posed for some pictures and did some stuff uh, with John. John tried to recruit her, telling her that she could make two to three thousand dollars in a weekend if she would fly around the country doing these these uh, bid these jobs for him. We thought perhaps um, that he might have been taking the women and selling them into prostitution, maybe across state lines, maybe even international lines. It was hard to figure out exactly what he was doing. Uh, you know, it seemed like he was a con man on one hand, but on the other hand, he seemed to be involved in these other things which were darker. With a mounting list of circumstantial evidence, but still no proof of an actual crime, investigators set up surveillance so they can track every move their suspect makes. We didn't want to tip our hand at any time to let Robinson know. We contacted him, the gig was up, and he would start, you know, denying everything and possibly sending us on goose chases. Within a matter of weeks, investigators learned that Robinson is, in fact, living a dual life. Well, at home, he's a family man. He's got four children, married, um, and very suburban, middle-class lifestyle. During the day, he's frequenting inner city, um, Kansas City, hanging out with these um, sort of sketchy underworld characters and, you know, prostitutes, strippers, and uh, lots of and lots of different kinds of women. We followed him to homes in the Johnson County area, and we followed him to motels where he had women meet him there. The man was just in total action until 5 o'clock when his wife got off work. Robinson thought he was smarter and brighter than, than anyone else, that uh, if he got caught, he would just tell another lie, as he had done for so many years. And uh, he didn't believe that there was anyone that was going to, to hold him accountable. We did a wiretap. Uh, we would subpoena records for internet usage. We got some search warrants for his email accounts. We had two women in Canada that were sharing emails that he was sending to them, and they were sending it to us, so we were getting almost real time his communications with them. That kind of gave us some insight into what he, he was doing. As investigators suspect, Robinson is frequenting the BDSM websites in search of slaves. Well, to me, he seemed like just a very commonplace uh, little man who you would never suspect being involved in uh, S&M type activities. He referred to himself in emails on a BDSM uh, website as master. And that's what we knew him as, the slave master. His pattern is, if anything, consistent. Robinson agrees to play master to eager submissives, enticing them further with the offer of a job. He promised them the moon. And a lot of these women just took it, were hooked, and came to Kansas City. Investigators are shocked to learn how many women would come to town to be a complete stranger's slave. At the master-slave level, the, the trust is considered to be inviolate. And that's a two-way street. Uh, the master has to have a complete trust of the slave, just as much as the slave has trust of the master. The authorities soon set up stakeouts at motels where Robinson entertains his out-of-town guests. And through the walls, a secret world comes alive. Or they could hear talking, a lady's voice, his voice. Uh, they, they could hear what they thought was maybe some slaps. And uh, we knew that he was into this BDSM um, lifestyle. 
and that probably was taking place in that room.